This is Tabaka, the home of soapstone and soapstone carving. Soapstone carving started abruptly in the village of Bomware when Nogori carved a small lure pot for carrying anointing oil and a smoking pipe for smoking tobacco in the early 1900s. When Mosetti Orina saw what Nogori had made, he also started carving household items such as bowls and cups and that is how the culture of soapstone carving started in Tabaka. Ria Onchomba was the first mining site in Tabaka. But lately, there are many mining sites each with a distinguishing quality. Soapstones are in specific areas in Tabaka and some mine owners discovered them on their property by chance. We wouldn't have known that the soapstone was on our property were it not for my neighbor, my uncle, who, when digging to make a toilet, discovered the first soapstones 15 feet deep. Small particle stones are first found when soapstones are discovered, indicating the presence of soapstones in the area. When they discovered these stones, they dug deeper and found the soapstones. They kept testing and discovered that there was a mine there. They stopped digging to make the toilet and opened a mining site. He opened the mining site and started selling the soapstones and eventually he got to our property boundary. That's when they discovered the soapstones were also on our property and started selling them. Mining can be done by individual covers but nowadays, it's preferable if mining experts did the work to ensure successful mining. When mining, the miners have to consider the colors that are mainly gray, pink, and mostly white, the size, workability, and the durability of the stone. When some stones are too hard to carve, others are way too soft that they break when exposed to the sun and drain, rendering them unusable. Once the miners have identified a stone that is suitable for their work, they remove it. Or if it's deep-rooted, they create a path for it to enable safe removal without breaking it. Mining soapstones used to be free but in 1967, Onsase started charging miners five shillings for seven huge blocks of soapstones, and that is how paying the mine owners became a tradition. However, this is becoming a problem to the mine owners because some covers opt to steal instead of buying. This is personal. Some of the cover's income is low and others don't have money, so some may come to steal. We quarrel and they will get mad and leave. I often wonder how I can help them, so I end up calling them back. Some may even come to steal at night with spotlights. I remember when people came to steal from my neighbors at dawn and the mine collapsed, burying them. In the beginning, mining was easier because the stones were closer to the surface. But with time, the stones became deeper, making mining a challenging task. Miners face various challenges when working, such as lack of proper mining tools which makes the process tedious and the flooding of mining sites during rainy seasons brings their work to a halt. 
they are also exposed to occupational hazards such as collapsing of mines. Mines can collapse when miners go deeper without removing the soil on top of the soapstones and when the thin layer of stone pillars supporting the sand is disrupted it can cause fatal accidents including death. This affects both the miners and the mine owners. Every time I hear a mine collapsed, I get affected. It breaks my heart and my body feels different. It's like when you have a car and you're told it has caused an accident. This is why it is advisable to remove the soil before mining and for the mining to be done by experts. It can take miners hours, even days to mine a stone. If you are lucky and you mine your stone safely, you can walk to the carving site or if the stone is big, you can have it transported by a motorbike. There are many carving sites. Some carvers decide to carve under trees, some at the comfort of their homes, but most prefer carving in groups. Carving in groups started in the early 1900s when Mosetti Orina used to call his brothers to help him carve and at the end of the day they would share a brewed drink. This tradition has been kept alive but now instead of sharing a brewed drink they share carving tools. At the carving site, the mined stone will be first cut into a desirable size depending on the sculpture to be made. Cutting is mostly done by a saw and if the stone is hard, it is usually a two person's job. With the stones becoming harder, it can take hours to cut depending on the size of the stone. After the stone has been cut, the carver will do some sketching if it is something new that he is carving. Most carvers have been carving for over 15 years, so they carve from memory. However, if they are carving something new, they will need a picture or a sample of what is being carved. After the sketching has been done, the cover will do the final cutting as desired with either a saw or a grinder. Grinders are a savior equipment that only few covers have. It comes in handy when cutting hard stones and one wants to do it quickly. When all that is done, the carving starts. While some stones are hard to carve and take longer, some stones are easier to carve making the Nyabigena stone the most preferable stone amongst the carvers. The Nyabigena stone is easy to carve with the use of simple tools such as a machete. This stone is the most preferable stone at the moment because it allows carvers to carve a lot of items in a day. Carving a lot of items is becoming a necessity because most of the items on demand at this stage go for 2 shillings to 100 shillings. Therefore, one has to carve many items to make enough money in a day. 
most covers are middle age because the young people in the community have been discouraged by the elders not to partake in the carving business because it has no value or future. Sopstone sculpture designs depend on what the buyer wants, but most of them range from household items such as sugar pots and water dispensers, appreciation sculptures, human sculptures, religious figures and chessboards. Most of the sculpture designs are usually animal figures. The designs have evolved over time, especially the animal figures which have gone from toy animals to one-dimensional figures to animal in action figures. Most carvers started carving so that they could provide for their families, while others started because their families lacked money for them to advance their learning. I loved carving. I used to feel like mechanism was my future. Even when I finished my class 7 exams, I applied for mechanic schools only. I wanted to study mechanics or go to construction, but I couldn't. So I ended up carving. I loved handiwork more than anything. I wished for someone to take me to study mechanics because that's what I wanted. But I didn't go. Carving was and is still a male dominated field. But as years have gone by, female carvers have also made their debut. For a very long time, women were only allowed to sand and transport soapstone products. In early days, women were discouraged to carve, not because they were women, but because of their short tempers and giving them sharp tools could have been a disaster waiting to happen. Carvers face a lot of problems, but the major one is the lower price that the carved items go for. Carvers go through many problems because one can carve and when a person comes to buy, they buy at a lower price then go sell it at a high one. Mostly, the goods we carve benefit the middlemen we sell to. We don't benefit so it's not easy. You could think most of us are well off, 
but we have problems. We don't get enough money to help us. You find one is a cover, but the way they dress or take care of their families is not good unless that person is borrowing money from circles or getting an order that is paying well. Currently, carving does not pay much because we mostly get enough money for food. After the carving is done, the base of the sculpture is balanced out using a sandpaper, marking the end of carving. Afterwards, the carved items are taken for sanding and the waste products can be used to make other items. This includes artboards being sieved to get a soft textured sand used in molding houses or getting transported to Uganda or at the river where they are turned into a powder used to make various items such as chalks and paints. Tabaka had its factory that used to crush the soapstone waste products and make chalks that were distributed in Kenya. The factory was opened in 1965 by Honorable Dr. Kiano, who was the Minister for Commerce and Industry back then, but sadly, it only survived for two years. Sanding is done using sandpapers that range from the roughest to the smoothest. The roughest sandpapers are used first to remove the stripes left by the knife during the carving stage. In the early 1900s, the sanding was done using the leaves of a tree called Omoseni, whose texture is as rough as the roughest sandpaper. The major problem that the washers face is the lack of work because their work depends on the availability of soapstone product demands. After all the stripes have been removed, they use smooth sandpapers leaving the sculpture with a smooth surface. After the sanding is done, the sculptures are washed to remove the white residue left behind from the sanding, then aired under the sun to dry before waxing. Waxing is done using a specific wax that makes the sculptures shine and also waterproof. The wax is applied by a brush then rubbed in by sisal fibers to give it a shiny look. During the early days, carvers used to use cow fat as their waxing agent. After the rubbing in is done, they use a cloth to wipe off the dust left behind by the sisal fibers. If a sculpture doesn't require color or incisions, it is then dipped in a clear varnish to give it a long-lasting shine, then aired to dry. Sculptures that require color are first washed with a spirit color that helps remove the white color of the stone. Mm -hmm. 
They are then washed with a water color with a similar color, leaving behind the expected color and some color residue. The residue is wiped off by a piece of cotton while also rubbing in the color, leaving the sculpture with a shiny look. After they dry off, some sculptures are sponged to add on their beauty and then they cross over to the waxing stage. In early days of sculpting, most items remained in their natural color but if one wanted to change the color, they had to burn the sculpture in intense heat to achieve that. Some sculptures, after the color and the sponging, they require art which is usually done by artists. Art drawn on the sculptures depends on what the buyer wants, but most clients prefer Maasai figures and wild animals. The art is drawn by a marker pen, and then after that, they are waxed for the first time. The edges of the art drawn are then opened and character is added to the animals by a sharp knife. When that is done, they are again waxed for the second time. The waxed items are then dipped in a clear varnish and then aired to dry. The clear varnish can take up to 3 hours to dry depending on the weather. When the varnish dries, the items are packed ready for distribution. The packaging must be done carefully, securing the items to ensure that they don't break while being transported. Soapstone items can get distributed both locally and internationally. Locally, soapstone sculptures are sold in wholesales 
that are situated in the small town of Tabaka. The first soapstone item to be sold was sold by Mosetti Orina to a white man in 1914. As the soapstone business picked up in the 1970s and 80s, many people set up shops within the community to sell their products while others distributed their goods to shops in Mombasa and Nairobi such as the African Heritage. Individuals who distribute their soapstone products outside Kisi need to have a permit that allows them to do so. Locally, many cooperatives have been set up to help the locals with distribution and exhibition of their products, but all have failed due to bad management. With the decline in demand and COVID-19, distributors are having a hard time selling their goods making them collect dust over time. COVID-19 has really impacted the price of soapstone products because now they don't get outside the community buyers as before. The price has gone down because we used to have tourists to buy from us before, so the prices were good. After COVID hit, the business has been down. While we get goods at cheap prices, we are also forced to sell them cheaply. Mine owners are urging the Kisi County government to step in and help them with equipment that will facilitate an easy and safe way to remove the sand on top of the soapstones because it's a big challenge for them. One of the major problems we face is soil removal. When removing the soil, we can go as deep as 25 feet without getting to the soapstones, which costs a lot of money. For example, I usually have four people removing the soil, and I pay them 300 shillings each, so they take 1,200 shillings in a day. And that is when there isn't much soil. When I want the soil to be removed from a larger area, I have to hire up to eight people to remove the soil quickly for the soapstones to be accessible. Paying for labor is very expensive. The mine has to be expanded and dug deeper for the soapstones to be found. Miners are asking the county government to provide them with transportation equipment that will help them safely remove the mined stones from the mining caves to the service because manual transportation can be dangerous during rainy seasons and in the steep areas. Carvers are requesting the county government to provide them with better cutting tools that will simplify their work. Mine owners, carvers and distributors are asking the government to help them with the marketing and distribution of soapstone products. Currently, if the government properly intervened, they could help with the marketing of soapstone products. There is a lot of mining happening in Kenya, and I feel like the government has forgotten that soapstone is also a sector of mining, bringing revenue to the country. If they took charge and declared that people buying soapstone products operate from a specific place, it would make it easy for covers to have a place to sell their goods directly. If they eliminate the middleman between the covers and the distributors, then the market might improve. Covers and distributors are also urging the government to set the price control for all the soapstone products. At a time when the soapstone future looks uncertain, people are still holding on to it in hopes that one day it will boom as it once did. Maybe it will, and maybe it won't. Only time will tell.